This is about the slaughter of Europe's birds passing through Cyprus. If you go out into the killing fields, yes, you'll find older people doing it, but you'll also find younger people doing it. Same with drugs. While there's money to be made out of it, people are going to get into it. There's a war going on here in Cyprus, a war between the old and the new, between Europeans and Cypriots, between wildlife activists and professional poachers. They're both fighting for the same thing, songbirds. While one side is trying to eat them, the other side is trying to save them. This is about a clash of cultures. When Cyprus joined the EU, local law tightened around the trapping of songbirds. But many saw this as an attack on the heritage of a small nation that's forever been fighting for its sovereignty. Far from the crime disappearing, instead it moved onto British-occupied territory, and what was once a local tradition quickly developed into an underground industry worth millions of euros. I think to describe it as a war is fair enough. And if I'm honest, at the moment, sadly, it's a war that we're losing. On the side of those trying to interrupt poaching are a set of international environmental activists who come to Cyprus each migration period. We're just a little bit further and we can have a walk. Andrea Rutigliano leads the Coalition Against Bird Slaughter, a group who used direct action to achieve their aim. At six in the morning, we meet up, and he takes me to a well-known trapping area to witness firsthand the slaughter of songbirds. So Andrea thinks he can hear a, a decoy. Now that it's daylight, you can hear loads of bird sounds. He's got an amazing ear. Can hear the difference between what's a decoy and what's a real bird. Among all of the yeah. sounds, you heard that from about 250 meters yeah, away. It's, uh, yeah, it's a long, longer training, yeah. but it's like your, your brain reacts like. It's eight, isn't it? So what we're hearing now is completely false. Yeah, I will. Is there a bird in there? There's a bird yeah, there. A... Fucking hell. I mean, this is the first bird that we've seen which has been trapped like this. It's, I mean, it's absolutely shocking to see this bird. So he's lost a few feathers. He's still yeah. got, has he still got his legs? He's still okay. No, 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 no. This is a black cap, so this is yeah, exactly what, species, this right. is the target species from Bellapulia. This is what people in Cyprus want to eat. He is beautiful. Yeah. The poacher's clearly gone in here, found a bird on the lime stick, slit its throat basically, and that's the blood from where the, the bird's basically been killed. The poacher's around, yeah, we just saw him just on the brow of that hill over there, sort of just wandering off. According to Andre, the poacher won't be confrontational in this situation because this is public land, so he'd never be able to say, this is my tree that you're interrupting. And yeah, you see, the, the, the technique is they use a great area for birds, then they found a juniper bush, which is the best, they trim it in a way. So, and in this life, they put lime sticks in the most possible horizontal way. And these are good to catch birds. That's an obvious stick for that bird to go and perch on. And this, this method, this is completely illegal, is that this right? This is completely illegal. This is protected the species, not uh, lesser white throat, is also endangered. Keep it on both sides. The lesser white throat is fine, perfect. The more they try to release themselves, the more they get stuck to the line. Okay, that's fine. Good fly. Altogether, we found five birds in this bush. Not all of them were the black caps, the target species. Others were more endangered, such as the lesser white throat. These are all out of just one tree. There's about 20 lime sticks here. 
and it's so sticky, this stuff. I mean, I can't even pull it apart. Have you recorded this one before? Uh, I had 282 further this way. So this is actually a new plane, new it's, point. So this is a new one? Yeah. So what are you going to do now? Yeah, well, when I'm back home in the, in the laptop, I will pinpoint this new trapping site. This is sort of Andrea one poacher nil today. Yeah, there's only one day. The other 60 days yeah, is poacher 60 and there are zero. Mm. The economic situation is quite bad and lots of people are unemployed and unemployment is rising. And it seems that people have turned to poaching as a way of making money. It's like, you know, it's like when you, when you like doing something and you, as, as long as the risks are not high enough, you just keep on doing. It's a, a meal you're used to, you're imprinted. You have eaten, been eating this since you're a child. So from a human point of view, I can even understand them. The, the point is, if every human being behaves like that, just keep on doing what they do without considering the whole picture, will destroy the planet in five, ten years. A major barrier for anyone attempting to eliminate the trapping of songbirds is that it's not simply an underground business enterprise, but also a cultural tradition. I heard a town where Ambella Puglia is in high demand is Paralimni, so I headed there to meet some locals who've been trapping birds all their lives. Cyprus is among the poorest countries in Europe, and many here believe the country got a raw deal from Brussels when its economy needed recovering after the financial crash. Instead of being offered a bailout, as its Mediterranean neighbours were, a bail-in was designed, but the experiment has done little to stabilise the country's economy. For some locals, trapping birds on top of being a tradition has always provided an extra source of income. So, even though in Cyprus it seems that Ambella Puglia eating and poaching is extremely common, it's been incredibly hard to find somebody to actually show us how to do it, basically. Anyway, we have done, and we're on our way to meet someone who's going to show us the traditional method of catching birds using lime sticks. We've come to a farm where we can't reveal it, but these are clearly men of the land here. They have been making these sticks for probably as long as they can remember. But this is a farm, basically. And so, just like any other bird or anything else that you harvest, I think that's their attitude towards lime sticking. They've got, um, they've got the miksha berries from the tree here. Miksha translates as snot. It's basically just sticky inside of a berry, which they've then mixed with some preservatives and some honey. And basically, it looks like he's sort of beating a batter together, basically. But it looks like making bread or something. It's incredible watching them do this process of, of covering the sticks. It, was, it took about one second to do that entire stick, but it's a two-man job, it seems. So one person holds it and the other person just stretches it out over the stick. They then put it on the glass, which is hot, which makes the glue set. This is the mixed shaberry, which is basically the basis of the lime stick. Squeeze out the middle and it's perfectly edible. In fact, people believe here that it's good for indigestion. What's he saying? 
I feel like I've got a mouthful of phlegm. That is what it's like. It's a mouthful of phlegm. <laughs> Either I don't know what's going on. Either I've been tricked, and I've stuck my tongue to the roof of my mouth. But basically, look at it. That's what comes out. It doesn't like you've just gobbed in your own mouth, basically. What's remarkable about this is that the groves are here. The mixha berries grow on the trees. They then use those berries to then make this glue. And it's basically in someone's backyard. You can imagine this is happening in every single plot, basically around the entire countryside. But there's also an organized side to this crime. And the commercial supply of this delicacy now happens on parts of the island where local police have no jurisdiction. Cyprus, once a British colony, achieved independence in 1960. However, in the agreement, Britain retained two large areas of the island for strategic use by the military. We're just uh, bird lovers at the beginning who wanted to, to take action. Andrea believes industrial slaughter of songbirds is happening solely on British sovereign territory. He and his cab's colleagues venture onto the bases each night to look for evidence of poaching. I'm putting on a bulletproof vest because apparently Andrea has been shot at him quite a few times when he's gone out and done these sort of reconnaissance missions in the middle of the night. So for safety, I'm not trying to be macho, I'm just putting on a bulletproof vest in case we get shot at. Andrea, what are we doing tonight? Okay, we're, we're going to listen for decoys to see the scale of the phenomenon and if possible we will try to approach a net or a mist netting site. So you act as sort of in, almost informants for the org, yeah. sort of, you provide intelligence to the police. Right, scouting work, we call it. Scouting work. I mean, shouldn't that be the job of the police, though? Well, we optimise their time. They don't, have, uh, they don't have so much manpower. From the satellite, you can see the size, the magnitude of and trapping here. It's enormous. It's amazing. It's, it's and each year, each migration period in this area, how many birds? Get trapped. We can we can talk about I think one million at least on in this area. Yeah, and is this British sovereign area? Yeah, this is British sovereign. Area. So this is happening on British soil, yeah, basically. Yeah, that's why the, the main point here is that Britain is responsible for the biggest trapping site in the whole world. So it's this is uh, this has got nothing to do with tradition. No, no, no. This is a huge business. Uh, we're talking about 15 million euro uh, involving criminal gangs. Uh, these are people who are. Who are, not, who are ready to, to shoot and kill if someone disturbs their business. Hence why I've got this one. That's why you have this one. We've been shot at a couple of times in this area in the night. These people are at full control of the situation. It's about legality, it's about uh, laws, the, the, the rule of laws in Cyprus. And it's amazing that Britain tolerates something like this here. The activist intelligence led us deeper into British territory. As a seasoned scout, Andrea was unfazed as we drove alongside the military satellites, although I was finding it hard to believe we were even able to get so close. Don't slam the door. Everything we can hear now, that's all decoys. Yes, these are tape lures. Black caps don't sing in the night, they don't sing in autumn. It's only done to lure the birds down from the sky. And so, do you reckon down here there might be some nets? Yeah, there will be probably nets. We followed our ears, which led us across a dust bowl and into an orchard. Despite Andrea's experience, it didn't make me feel any safer about going onto someone's private land.
So we've just come out of an orchard there, which is basically a stone's throw from what's behind us. Andrea and the cab slot have taken down four industrial sized nets that have clearly just gone up. They've released two birds that were in there, but basically they've got them just before dawn, when those nets will be full basically. And that's where all the birds are going here. I wondered how the poachers were operating with such impunity. Was this local crime too trivial for the military-based police when the purpose of their presence there is purely for matters of British national security? We're on our way to meet a divisional commander at the Sovereign Base Police. We're going to talk to him about how they go about policing what's essentially a culture and how they police a culture that's not theirs, basically. So, explain to me the role of the SBA police in this, in Cyprus. The SBA police police the southern base areas in the same way that the civil police back in the UK cover their particular areas. We have responsibility for all matters both inside the, the, the garrison station and in the local community. So we are in effect the civil police for the area. If it's been illegal since the 1970s, yes. why does the culture of eating on Bellapulia and I suppose the crime of poaching them still take place on quite a prolific scale. I think traditionally it was acceptable in inverted commas to take a few birds for the family table. Things have changed enormously. Trappers can make between 30, 40, 50,000 euros tax-free, criminally, in a season trapping these birds and passing them on to restaurants to sell and retail throughout Cyprus. I mean, how hard is it to police a culture? Very, very difficult. You don't think you can police a culture, particularly when you are, in many senses, a guest within the country. You know, I don't think it's for the police to impose the culture. We do what we can educationally. Would you say that in order to be able to keep community relationships strong, as guests here, just to use your words, in this country, you need to respect the fact that this is a cultural crime? I don't think that at all. I think what you'll find is that um, although this is accepted culturally by some sections of the community, a recent, a recent poll showed that about 70% of Cypriots were against the practice of trapping. Having already found evidence for myself that trapping goes on on British soil, the officer's acknowledgement that he is a guest on the island left me feeling that his ability to take action was somewhat compromised by his post-colonial status. I went to talk to BirdLife Cyprus, a local organisation, to get their view on the matter. Can you tell me why trapping birds seems to be allowed to take place on British mm. soil? Yeah, it does seem to be allowed, doesn't it? Part of the answer, maybe, is that there's always been the policy with the British sovereign bases of turning a blind eye to things that might annoy the ro local residents who are in the bases. The argument is that this is part of Cypriot culture mm. and People in Cyprus have been doing this for 500 years. All true. But it's true, it's a traditional practice. It's a traditional practice gone crazy in terms of the scale of it. You can't compare what was happening 50 years ago in Cyprus with a few people putting up some lime sticks. And this is the image that people still have in their minds when they're eating them. They have the image of the little old man setting a few lime sticks. What's the harm in that? That's not the reality on the ground. The reality is completely different. The other point is that 50, 100 years ago, these birds were far more abundant. They just weren't facing all the other pressures that they are facing today. So we're now on our way to meet a professional poacher. This is a bloke who makes his entire living, basically, out of catching songbirds. He's told us he does it both ways. He does it the traditional lime stick way, but because he makes his living out of it, he also does it in the industrial mist net way. He's going to remain anonymous because, in his court, this activity could land him with a prison sentence. But he has also said that he is willing to show us how and hopefully why he chooses to do this.
presuming he's got a tree. He knows over the years. It's a good one. So this looks like it's basically perfectly designed. It's got the two poles at either end and this net in a bag which stretches just perfectly to, to either side. Can't imagine how you'd start to even police this because we are in the absolute middle of nowhere, driven for miles. The only, it, the land is so flat, so anyone that was coming here, you'd be able to see them from a mile off. And all it is is two sticks and this net that he's got in a bag. And that he's flushing birds out, basically. <laughs> it seems like a slightly sort of easy way of hunting. You know, you, you picture the hunter goes out, there's a skill to it. All he's done is strung up a net, throw a few rocks in the bush, and just caught his load, basically. Are you afraid of the police? <laughs> Having met enough locals to appreciate that trapping birds is a large part of Cypriot culture, the only thing left to do was to try Ambelapulia for myself. It's not like it's listed on menus, but someone we'd met was proud to lead us to a favourite restaurant where the dish is supposedly cooked to perfection. This you can eat very good soup. So that's the soup? Salt and lemon. Well, I mean, all I can see is little sort of heads and eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. So is that putting salt on it? Not salt. Sizzle. The best meze in Cyprus, apparently. And you have it with pomegranate as well. And yogurt. So this is basically the most traditional, and according to locals here, the best Cypriot meze that money can buy. <clears throat> All together. The most traditional bit in Cyprus, to look inside it. And Bella Puglia is an acquired taste, and my obvious struggle to swallow had offended our hosts. It was hard to detach the crunch of tiny bones and bitter flavour of guts from the image of this fragile bird stuck upside down in a bush. We're in the middle of a village in Cyprus. Now, we're away from Nyanapa, right in the heart of the country, where tonight they're parading the bones of an old saint. Tradition and culture is clearly at the heart of Cypriot life here, of which Ambella Puglia also sits. Cyprus has had a wretched history and has spent the last 50 years trying to gain independence and preserve its identity. For those who feel that the latest threat has come from EU membership, 
trapping and eating songbirds has become an emblem of nationalism and a food of defiance. But the stakes have been raised for anyone trying to safeguard this national dish. Their efforts have been met by increased enforcement and greater organisation. Although some hope condemnation will spread across Europe and pose a threat to the tourism industry in Cyprus, locals who are passionate about preserving their heritage are just as prepared to dig in for the long fight.